Hey everyone! In this video lesson, we're going to be doing a little crash course on circuits. Just some of the basics of what a circuit is, what it requires in order to function, um, and some of the relationships among the different characteristics and components that define a circuit. Now, when I'm talking about a circuit, the first thing that I think of is current, this movement of charge through uh, this particular pathway that I have defined with my wires, okay? So that this is sort of the first fundamental thing that we need in a circuit in order for it to function is we have to have charged particles moving around um, this particular pathway. Now these charged particles are typically electrons and they could be um, other types of ions, uh, but in any case, we're talking about some sort of electrical charge moving along uh, through this predefined pathway. All right now when we talk about current we define it in or excuse me we measure it in the units of amperes. All right so uh, amperes are uh, abbreviated with a capital A and when I talk about one ampere of current what I'm describing is a rate of one coulomb of charge passing through a particular point each second. All right, so then from these units of current is measured in amperes, amperes are coulombs per second. You can probably guess that our equation for current is just that we're going to take our amount of charge in coulombs and divide by the amount of time it takes that charge to pass through our circuit. And that has to be measured in seconds because amperes are coulombs per second. All right, so straightforward enough definition of just what current is, how we measure the rate at which we're getting charges moving through our circuit. All right now, that being said, not all uh, not all objects, not all substances are equal when it comes to allowing a current to flow through a circuit. Um, so if you have ever uh, had any wires get broken. I know I used to have a cat that was notorious for chewing through all of my cables and cords um, and a rabbit after that come to think of it. So lots of lots of little furry animals with death wishes here. Um, but anyway, if you've ever seen a wire cut in half, essentially, what you see is that the wire itself is made out of metal, um, some sort of flexible metal. But then we cover that wire with rubber or plastic. Why is that? Ultimately, it all comes down to how readily charges can actually move through each of these materials in order to form a current. Um, conductors, things like metal, uh, are materials that um, don't hang very tightly to their electrons. The electrons are all kind of free and breezy, just sort of shared among the different nuclei floating around in there. And so it's really easy then to get those electrons moving along through our circuit and to get a current flowing. Okay, so a conductor is something that allows a current to easily flow through it, whereas the opposite of that would be an insulator, things like that rubber or plastic on the outside of those wires. Insulators tend to cling more tightly to their electrons, which means it's a lot harder to get those electrons to actually move in a consistent pattern through uh, the material to get a current really flowing. So then the reason that it's so ingenious that we uh, we make wires out of metal but then coat them in some sort of insulator like rubber or plastic is that we're able to get the current to flow easily through our wire but then the insulative uh, coating holds that that current in place and says no 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 no, no. just move along the wire please do not redirect to like the floor or a human or anything like that. So that allows us to keep the current flowing just where we want it to. Okay. Now, um, there are a couple different ways that current can flow depending on the nature of the power source that is propelling that current. Okay, our first type of current, the more straightforward one for us to focus in on, is DC, direct current. Um, and when we have a direct current, what that really means is that all of our charges are just moving in the same direction. They're all on that same pathway. Think about like a race car on a racetrack, like they're all going the same way. 
doing their thing, okay? And this is because they have one steady power source that is fixed in place. So anything that is battery operated is gonna operate on direct current because all of the charges are gonna be compelled to move in the same direction, all right? The other alternative is alternating current or AC. Uh, so with an alternating current, as you might guess, uh, the power source is, is alternating, it's oscillating back and forth. This is how our power grid works, actually. We don't have just a set um, set voltage in place. More on that in just a moment. Um, but instead, we kind of have this oscillation of move this way. No, move that way. No, move this way. No, move that And so our little charges are very confused. And so our current goes this way, and then the other way, and then this way, and then the other way. Um, and obviously, I have to mention that with the options being DC and AC, um, immediately we should think of, you know, rock music here. Um, and ACDC actually did get their name from looking at a sewing machine um, and some of the specs on it, and it talked about ACDC. Like, it was literally talking about current. And they were like, that's a great name for a band. And they even have a little lightning bolt. Like, it's all, it's all physics. All right. Now, just to illustrate this for you a little bit more, I have a short simulation of DC and AC circuits to show you. Notice how in the DC circuit, the direct current has all of our charged particles moving the same way the entire time. In our AC alternating current circuit, we see those charges swaying back and forth. Now, let's really dive into what what does that actually mean? Why is it that a battery will always produce this direct current, but um, this, this idea of this oscillating power source will, will create this alternating current? So let's think back to last unit for just a moment. Um, when we were talking about fields and energy and all of that, um, let's see if we can fill in the blanks. Charges will tend to move from areas of what kind of potential energy to what kind of potential energy? Much like objects with mass in gravitational fields, we know that charges move from high potential energy to low potential energy. Charges, like us, are lazy. They seek out the lowest energy state possible. All right, so charges will move from high potential energy to low potential energy. This is true in a circuit as well. But when we're looking at circuits, we tend not to use the term potential energy. We tend to simplify it down um, to another related term which is the idea of electric potential. Now, electric potential isn't exactly the same as electric potential energy, but it's similar. If we had more time, I would dive more into like what exactly is the relationship between electric potential and electric potential energy, um, but we don't have time, so I'm not going to right now. If you're curious, come ask me. All right, but basically when we think of electric potential, it's kind of a stand-in for potential energy in our circuit. We measure electric potential in volts, which is a unit you may have heard of before, okay? So again, just to kind of make the leap then from talking about like point charges in fields to now talking specifically about circuits, um, we said before that charges move from high to low potential energy, and in much the same way, current will flow from high to low electric potential. Okay, so same relationship, same idea. We're just tweaking the terminology a little bit, right? So current will move from high to low electric potential, which means that in order to predict which way a current is going to flow, we really need to know which areas have higher potential and which areas have lower potential and what kind of difference there is throughout our circuit. This brings us to the idea of voltage. When we're looking at voltage, we're really measuring how big of a difference is there in electric potential between two different locations, all right? And the bigger that voltage is, the faster the current is going to move through our circuit. So when you pick up a battery, all right, and it says like nine volts or something like that, what that's really telling you is that one terminal of the battery has nine volts more of electric potential than the other terminal of the battery. And and that's what's going to be driving our current through our circuit. Our, our little charges are going to be trying to go from high potential down to 
low potential. And so that's really what's going to be propelling our current through our circuit, okay? And then voltage gives us a sense of basically how big of a push our current is getting, forcing it through our wires and through our circuit, all right? To kind of think about voltage in more mechanical terms, terms that we're maybe more used to thinking about, um, we could essentially think of voltage as, um, as the height and steepness of a hill, all right? Um, so that gives us a sense of how much, like the same way that height represents some measure of gravitational potential energy, voltage gives us sort of a similar measure of electric potential energy. Okay, um, and much the same way that um, a current of water, like a river or a stream or something like that, is going to move faster down a higher, steeper hill, in the same way, uh, electric current is going to move faster through a circuit that has a higher voltage. Okay, so same kind of idea here. Um, and so ultimately, what we need from our circuit is a complete path from both high to low potential. This is why if we try to connect a wire to only one side of a battery, nothing happens. The current isn't going to flow because it doesn't know which way it's supposed to go. It's like, is this, is this the high potential side? Is this the low potential side? Like, what do you... What do you want me to do? All right. So we need to connect it to both a high and a low potential terminal of a battery in order to really propel our, our charges in one particular direction. So then our last major characteristic of our circuit that I want to dive into is the idea of resistance. All right. Now, much as resistance is like opposing things in general. Um, resistance in a circuit, same idea. We're talking about an opposition to current, something that's trying to slow our current down, trying to thwart it, trying to keep the charges where they are and prevent them from moving, moving smoothly through our circuit. Now, resistance is measured in a new unit, which we call ohms. And we represent ohms uh, or, or abbreviate ohms with a capital Greek letter omega. Um, which looks kind of like a horseshoe, basically. So, so pulling out, busting out our Greek alphabet skills. Um, and when we talk about something that provides resistance in a circuit, most things that we are plugging into a circuit ultimately serve the purpose of, of providing resistance. They are additional hoops that our current has to uh, jump through in order to get from one side of the circuit to the other. So whether we're talking about like a light bulb or your refrigerator or you know a music player or something like that all of those things ultimately are providing resistance slowing down our circuit okay so we've got voltage propelling our current forward we've got current the thing that's actually moving through our circuit um, and then resistance which is trying to slow it down so to illustrate all of this i have a delightfully creepy little uh little cartoon for you there you go. Okay, so again, our amperes, our current is trying to move through the circuit. Voltage is the thing that is trying to propel, push the current forward. Um, but our very sadistic little resistance measured in ohms uh, is trying to make it more difficult, trying to slow down our current. That's enough of that very strange little cartoon there. Okay. Um, now, resistance may seem like a bad thing, like we want current to be flowing through our circuit, so why would we make it harder for current to flow? Um, and that's because it's it's really actually very important uh, that current be regulated in some way. Also, because circuits are only useful if they're powering like a light bulb or a toaster or something useful like that that provides resistance. Without that, what's the point of the circuit? All right. But anyway, um, resistance is really, really important. You may have heard of the idea of a short circuit before. You may also remember that when we created, at least virtually, not in real life, virtually created this uh, little wiring configuration that you see here, uh, that a, a fire was started. That's because what you created was a short circuit. Now, when we say short circuit, what we're describing is a circuit where there is a near zero resistance pathway from the high potential to the low potential side of the battery, okay? So there is nothing to slow down our current and our charges are flying out of control. 
all right? Imagine, like, if we're going with our, our gravitation analogy, imagine a situation where gravitational acceleration is essentially limitless, all right? And things are just, like, like flying through as quickly as possible, and things start to fly out of control, essentially. So as we get our current attempting to reach infinite speed, um, it's going out of control. We're melting that insulation. Our current's going everywhere. We're starting fires and generally um, colorful bad things happen. So um, so we try to avoid short circuits. We try to make sure that there is enough resistance in our circuit to prevent our wires from malfunctioning. Because once that happens, uh, current goes out of control and, and we have a bad situation really quickly on our hands. Okay. So just to revisit then some of these different ingredients for our circuits. So, so far we've been playing with batteries, wires and light bulbs. Let's start with the battery. What is the purpose of the battery in a circuit? Well, our battery is providing voltage and the importance of voltage is that it's pushing our current forward. No voltage means no push to our current, nothing that's gonna, gonna kind of get it moving all in one direction. All right, what about the wire? Why, why do we need a wire in our circuit? The wire ultimately provides us with a pathway for the current to travel on. It's a nice open road, low resistance, so it's nice and easy for our current to travel and we can really direct which way it's going with the wire. Lastly, aside from lighting up, which is you know the most obvious purpose of the light bulb, why else do we need a light bulb in our circuit? Why couldn't we just have a battery and a wire? A light bulb is super essential to our circuit because it provides that resistance. It prevents us from shorting out our circuit, creating electrical fires, having current uh, flow out of control. All right. Now, last thing to get into is a little bit more of that mathematical relationship among some of these different quantities. All right, so in our investigation, we looked at relationships among current voltage and resistance. So just to revisit, what is the relationship between current and voltage? That's a linear relationship, a proportional relationship. If voltage increases, current's going to increase as well at the same rate. Okay, so we double the voltage, we double the current. All right, what about current and resistance? What kind of relationship did they have? They have an inverse relationship. All right, so as resistance goes up, current goes down by the same factor. So if I double the resistance in a circuit, the current is going to drop down to one half of what it used to be. Okay, so what we need is an equation that sums all of this up for, for uh, current to have both a linear relationship with voltage and an inverse relationship with resistance what equation is best going to, to serve those purposes and, and encapsulate all of those relationships? It's really this simple. So current is equal to voltage over resistance. We've got voltage in the numerator because it's a linear relationship. We got resistance in the denominator for that inverse relationship. And then because people tend to hate fractions for whatever reason, we can just multiply both sides of the equation by R to get this happy non-fractiony form of this, uh, this relationship, voltage equals current times resistance, okay? So that's kind of what this all comes down to. I represents current measured in amperes, V is voltage measured in volts, and R represents resistance, which is measured in good old ohms. Lastly, let's just walk through a sample problem together. So we've got a 240 ohm light bulb and 0.6 coulombs of charge are moving through that light bulb every minute. Now, assuming there's nothing else on this circuit, nothing else that's kind of messing with our current, what must be the voltage of the power source that is powering this light bulb? So let's work through our guess method. Um, some of the information that we know. So I see this 0.6 coulombs of charge. Um, so that represents charge. All right, so charge is 0.6 coulombs. The next thing I know is that um, it takes one minute for these 0.6 coulombs of charge to move through our light bulb. So that represents our time. And again, we always want to measure time in seconds. So instead of using one minute, I'm going to convert that over and say 60 seconds. I also see this number of 240 ohms. What does that represent about my circuit? 
That's the resistance of my light bulb. So the resistance is 240 ohms. I am trying to solve for voltage. Now, before I can solve for voltage, I'm going to have to solve for current, which I can do because I know the amount of charge moving through my circuit, and I know the time frame over which that charge is moving. So I'll solve for current by dividing charge by time. So 0 0.6 coulombs per 60 seconds gives me a current rate of 0 0.01 amperes. And then from there, I can solve for voltage using, excuse me, Ohm's law. So voltage, voltage is equal to current times resistance. So that's 0 0.01 amps times 240 ohms, giving me 2.4 volts on my circuit. All right, that is it. That's your crash course in some of the basics of circuit functioning. Thanks so much for joining me.